If I was to ask you, how long would it take you to design a line following robot? Would you be able to give me a good estimate? Or even better, if I was to give you the go ahead, would you actually be able to achieve that time? I mean, without doing a lot of overtime and drinking a crap load of coffee, can you do it? So with that in mind, welcome to another episode of Hash to Find Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Rona Sosa. So the whole point of that intro is just to kind of tell you that in today's episode, I'm going to talk about keeping track of your project or at least being able to estimate a good time for when someone asks you so that you can at least try and achieve a good time for your projects. Because quite often, one of the biggest mistakes that you tend to have uh, with projects being constantly overrun and stuff like that is underestimating how long something's going to take you. And I'll be upfront, estimating projects for the sort of stuff that we do, electronic designing, software writing, or anything that requires you to be a bit more creative with, that isn't consistently the same task the same way every time, it's hard. It really is hard to estimate a project for a time for anything like this. And I'll be upfront, it took me years before I finally figured out a good system that actually worked for me. And I was constantly working on it. I mean, I kind of eventually found something that worked for me. And I'll tell you now, if you're thinking about doing freelancing or contract work or even better, um, if you're working full time and you're constantly finding yourself missing deadlines, this is going to be useful. Not necessarily the techniques that I've done, but at least thinking about how you can improve from that, because that is usually a great way of going about improving both your reputation in the company you're working off, working on, uh, or in the case of freelancing contract work, making sure you can optimize uh, the uh, profit that you're making from the work that you're doing. Because you have to think about it this way. If you're doing freelancing or contract work for, you know, in, the, in that aspect, you're only getting paid for what you're working for. And if you're working on fixed time contracts, the more time you spend on the project, the less money you're going to make. Or if you're working on a dynamic project where, uh, not a dynamic project, if you're working on a project where you get paid for what you work on, the more time you spend working on a project and having to go back to your client and tell them, actually, it's going to take me longer than that, you're going to look bad and your clients might not necessarily want to work, on, work with you again. And so this is really important for that sort of stuff. But I, I'm going to say it, it's just as important for working on doing, you know, keeping track of your projects and at least being able to estimate good, est- uh, good times on your projects. It's just as important for full-time work. So let's hopefully, you know, hopefully you can get something good out of this from this uh, episode. But as, like, I, like I always say, it, whatever I'm going to do, or whatever I tell you here, isn't necessarily going to be good for everybody. So it's all about finding your system. And hopefully I've given you enough, or I'll, I'll be giving you enough in this episode for you to kind of try something out, or at least think about trying something different. So before I start, I'm going to first give you a situation that I was in, or at least what happened to me when I first started out working in this industry. And so you can kind of see what made me drive myself into finding a better system. So when I first started out for the first company I worked for, I, I'll tell you, I, you know, I just came out of university. I only knew how to track projects the way university teaches you, which is basically uh, logbooks and PERT charts and Gantt charts. And I can tell you that doesn't work for me. It, it never did. Gantt charts are great for managers to show off projects to other people and kind of let them know what's going on. And even better for people, you know, again, like for managers who need a way to visualize what you're doing. But for an engineer who basically is getting paid to code and write hard, uh, code and uh, design hardware, it's it can be a pain, especially when you're being forced out of your way to maintain that sort of documentation when you don't really feel like it's adding to you the actual project you're working on. But I can tell you now that you do need something, maybe something that will improve your workflow, but you still need something that doesn't, well, I'll, I'll be upfront, something that doesn't impair your work, but I still allows you to be able to look back and see, okay, that's how I've done it. So for the first company I was working on when I first started out working in this industry or working in electronics altogether, I was always found myself uh, either overestimating or more often than not underestimating how long a task would take me. And it makes sense. I was new to designing uh, electronics for a company. I was new writing code uh, on project deadlines that you know, such as the company I was working for. I, you know, it was hard for me to tell them the exact time, but you were always faced with that. You were always asked, "How long would it take you to do that?" And it's difficult. It's difficult to tell them, "Oh, actually, it's actually going to take me a day to do that." It's, it's, you know, it's hard to actually 
give people a good estimate when you don't know what you, how long it's going to take, especially for the stuff that we do. We don't work in a factory. We don't design, um, we don't sit down in a chair and build the same board every day. We don't, we don't have the exact systematic setup every single time. We don't have the exact steps to do the same job. It's going to alter slightly different. And that difference is enough to throw the time from anywhere between minutes to hours and days and years, if for that matter. Years, obviously, an extreme based on what I'm thinking here. But the point is, we're not in a situation where we can, by looking at going, it's going to take me a day. You are relying on your experience. You're relying on the stuff that you've dealt with before to come up with that number. But I'll tell you now, if you're new to this industry, if you're new to electronics, what can you do? Or, I mean, if you're new, you know, you're not dealt with this sort of stuff before. How can you give a good estimate? I mean, in all honesty, if the company is doing the job right, you shouldn't be in a situation if you're new, you know, if you're brand new, just started for a company, I guess you can say you're a greenhorn. If, you, if you're in that situation, you shouldn't be asked how long something's going to take you. They should be talking to your mentor or the person who is guiding you to ask how long would it take them to do because they should have the experience to tell you, okay, it would take me a day to do this, but because he's new, I reckon it's going to take him three days. Hopefully, if your mentor is doing his good job, he'll be able to overestimate for the work you do and compensate for what you know for the lack of knowledge that you, you don't have. I mean, if you're new to it, you should be, I guess you can say, being in an apprentice position, you should be, you know, you should have a mentor who's actually dealing with that sort of stuff. But the point is, even if you're in that situation, you should already be working towards figuring, figuring all this out yourself. You should be in a self-sustained situation sooner or later where you can actually accurately tell people it will take you this much time. I say accurate, but be able to give a good estimate, at least with the experience you're gaining. But I ask you now, though, are you going to go the hard way or are you going to go for the quicker way? The hard way is you're constantly working on a project, you're constantly dealing with it, you're constantly having to figure out and eventually you start building up a mental picture on something it's going to take you or you're going to just do the easy way out like, I, like I've been doing and that's actually just track my projects. I time everything that I do, maintain a good record of what, what I'm working on and when. I mean, I have to, I'm, I'm a contractor. If, you, if you're a contractor freelancer and you're not, time, you're not keeping timesheets or you're not keeping records of what you're working on, you're gonna actually have a difficulty proving to your clients what you've worked on, or at least you can have difficulty of actually chart, uh, invoicing people because you don't really know how much time you've spent. And this is important for freelancers or contractors to be able to know how long something's going to take and actually prove that something's taking that long. And the nice thing is, if you're keeping records, you can actually go back and actually see how long something's taking. So when you next time come to quote somebody else for it or somebody else for some similar project, you actually have, you actually are in a situation of gaining profits, which, which is what it's all about when you contract a freelancer. Think about it. You are only selling a single product per client. You're not selling the same services twice. You can't you know, you're not, you are the product and you're only able to offer yourself once per client or whatever the project you're working on. And so it's important you can try and optimize the amount of time you spend on that project and try and make the most money out of it without wasting time going back and having to kind of go back to your client. So actually, you know, I told you it, took me, it was going to take me five days. Actually, in reality, it's going to take me 10 days. That's difficult to go back to your clients and tell them that. It's, it's a tough thing to do. So do bear that in mind. And, you know, in all honesty... If you're planning to become a freelancer, a contractor, or whatever else you want to call it, if you're planning to do that and you're not able to give good estimate and you're not able to actually make it within that deadline without having to constantly be drinking coffee and, well, not coffee, but just constantly doing all the time and obviously coffee comes along with that, then you're going to be, able, you're going to get to, you want to constantly be in a situation of that you're risking of losing money. Now, there's a couple of ways you can, if you're a freelancer and contractor, there's a couple of ways you can charge your clients. You can either charge based on a fixed cost, which is usually riskier, but has the potential of gaining you more money, or you can charge them as you work. In both cases, you're going to be, in, you can, you're going to be faced with a couple of problems with the regards to uh, fixed costs. If you're uh, overestimating a project, you may not get the contract, but if you're underestimating the, con the project, you may actually end up losing money because if you think about it with a fixed cost, the, the moment you start that project, you're losing money. And the quicker you get that project done within the fixed cost, the more money you're going to get out of it. Kind of the way you said, fixed cost. Hey, it's going to take me um, this much money to do it. You took 50%, you got 50% back from that where you're actually gaining from that. Now, 
do bear in mind that if you overestimate the project and somebody's gone ahead and given you the contract for everything, great. That, you know, good salesmanship, we're all winners here. Well, more you than your client, but eh, you see what I mean. But with regards to a variable contract where you just where you just get paid for what you do, if you overestimate the project, because quite often it's courtesy to tell them how long you reckon it's going to take them, uh, how long you reckon it's going to take you, if you overestimate it, they might not be happy. They might not give you the contract, or if you underestimate it, which is just as uh, which is just as bad, and you start and you, you keep having to go back to actually it's going to take me an extra day. They might not be happy that they they are, they're having to actually pay you extra for what they thought would only take you a day to do. And you're actually taking three days to do it. So you don't want to be in the situation and which is just as bad at contract work. So going back to when I first started out, I was bad. I was really bad at the time to actually estimate people what the project were. I at the time I was doing the same thing that I was taught when I was at university, which was didn't it doesn't work for me. It works for other people. But I was keeping a gun chart. I was even going as far as far as keeping a perp chart. So if anybody uh haven't heard of a perp chart, I mean I'll quickly mention what it is. Perp charts are awesome for pointing out where the critical path is to do a task. Basically, you end up graphing in sort of node-like system the path you have to take to achieve the project. So for example, if I want to design this line uh, line following robot, uh, I'll start out with first, I need to do a concept, uh, maybe a requirements, assuming, let's just say we've already had the requirements, we've, we've been given the spec for it. So. First stage would be um, finding the parts that I want to use. So that would be one stage. The next stage would be ordering the parts. And then the time it takes for the parts to arrive, that would be, that'll be your supplies then, your time. So that that would be a um, a branch of that perp chart where you have to wait for the, the supplies to receive parts. But while that's happening, while you're waiting for your parts to arrive, you could be getting on with other stuff. Maybe you start writing code. So that that's your path going down a different direction, designing code. And the point is that eventually it all kind of meets somewhere else. Um, let's say your suppliers are relying on some Chinese company to maybe make some custom parts to be sent to them. They have some sort of perp charts or whatever whatever path they need to follow. So that comes back and then you need to build the board. And imagine that one branch has loads of different tasks that you have to follow through. That's the critical path because there's more things happening in one branch than the other. And if something goes wrong on that, then everything's relying on that to make, make it on time. You know, that's the sort of thing that the perp chart does. It allows you to see all the different branches and which one's the most heavy, the most risky. And so you can try and maybe talk to those people working on that to try and get that to happen. Or maybe try and reduce the branch, maybe offload the work to somebody else to, you know, that's the, what's the point of the whole perp chart. And I, I, to be honest, when I was a uni, I, I enjoyed putting together Gantt charts. Or, or let me be more precise, I enjoy faking Gantt charts because in all honesty, when I was at university, I will be. I, I pretty much finished the project before I had to go backtrack and do a, a gun chart to make it look like we actually kept one because it was always something that we always forget to do. But I always enjoyed making them, and I always assumed that when I worked full time that I had to do them. But I didn't really enjoy them. I didn't really enjoy doing them when I started working full time. I mean, but I enjoyed making them. I was a uni, or faking them while I was a uni. But maybe that was a hint as to that that wasn't working for me, uh, or that wasn't good for me. Uh, I don't know, everybody has different things, but anyway, so when I started working in this company, I basically did what every person who left university did, and that's basically use the skills you gain from university or whatever you gain your skills. And, uh, and to be honest, in apprenticeship, you're, probably, you're often in a better posi position because you're learning from somebody who's been doing it for longer. But but anyway, so I was in a situation where I was doing gun charts and it just wasn't working for me. I, I spent more time attending the gun charts and more time adjusting it because I, it didn't really quite work and more often than not, uh, I didn't really go back to, to see where things failed because gun chart doesn't, it's they're great to visualize what's coming ahead, but they're hard to see the differences. Uh, I mean, I know there's some software out there. I think Microsoft Project allows you to compare different gun charts and see what the difference is. But in all honesty, if you don't have that license or if you're using some of the other ones, it's not as intuitive, I tell you that. It's not as easy to kind of see. And not as easy at least as, as to what I actually do now anyway. And so it was difficult. And so I just gave it up. And what I started doing is just kind of slowly, the more the more projects I worked on, I started building up an idea how long something, something took me to do it. And I always end up overestimating. Um, it wasn't until I went to a conference, and I forget the name of it, but Jack Gansel was on that conference. I think it was 2000. 
uh, I forget, I think it's like 2004, or six, it's a long time. Well, at least for me, it was quite a while back. But yeah, Jack Gunster came over to the UK. He was doing a session about um, uh, bug fixings and stuff, that, you know, the stuff that he usually does. But some of the other courses at the same time were doing things like, oh, what, what can you do to try and improve your time and stuff like that. And then when we got back to the office, me and this other colleague who went there, when we got back to the office, we sat down and started figuring out, okay, this is what we're going to start doing. And one of the things is to overestimate your projects and the way to do that or the way we thought would be better for us is if we both try to plan the same project and together give each other's estimate and then together talk about why we're giving each other that estimate and then hopefully hopefully go back figure out again okay so uh, this person said that it's actually going to take five days i thought it's going to be six days maybe it might be better if we go for six days because i'm thinking it's going to take this long so you go back to the meeting and agree on a time based on what you both have quoted and that might work for you. And in fact, that might work better if you are working in a project with multiple people who are working on the same project. That might be, in fact, that would be the better situation for it because you both are aware of it. But in our case, the situation was that we both were working on separate projects that weren't even related, unless apart from the one instance where they actually did send data to each other. But apart from that, they were completely unique and different projects altogether. The point is, this person had to go go and look at all my project designs that I was working on. I had to look at all his project designs to try and quote how long it would take me to do his project and he had to quote how long, you know, it, and it just seemed like an on, uh, like an extra bit of work and it, it didn't work. It didn't work for us because it, that wasn't the workflow we were used to and, and it was, if anything, it was slowing us down. So it didn't work, but that might work for you. So I would, you know, maybe give that a try. If you, there's two of you working on the same project, sit down, Estimate, write down what you think it's going to take separately, not together, and then have a meeting and and discuss why you both quoted that. And maybe he, you know, maybe uh, the person you're talking to uh, may have realized actually you need to do this extra thing to do that and you might not. And that helps. And that would definitely help. And then once you've done that, pat it out, add extra days to that. But obviously take into account whether that's actually going to be passed by your managers or your bosses or your clients for that case or not. But in a situation like me, which you may be in, where you're basically stuck working on the project on your own, that doesn't work. It didn't work for me. Um, it, if anything, it, it actually ended up wasting a lot more company time because there's two people now having to do twice as much work to look at each other's designs and to get it working. Now, I'd be upfront, there'll be situations where you need the other engineer to look at your project and verify that what you've been doing. This is all to do with project reviews and you may need to do that. But for way we were working on, that didn't work. The projects weren't that complicated that you could actually need more than one person and more often than we're both on tight deadlines so it actually made it more difficult. If I remember it rightly, uh, when I finally left that company, the other two person that were left there, they decided to actually start doing that to actually both work on the same projects together and then that way, I mean, I, I, I can definitely, I'll maybe come back to that later, how that's actually quite useful. But for this sort of stuff that I was kind of dealing with that before I left, that was just it. I worked on my own, he, the other person worked on his own. We talked to each other through ideas when we were stuck on things. But generally speaking, we dealt and fixed and reviewed our own work, which wasn't the best of things. And in all honesty, if anything, it made things harder than anything. But I'll be upfront. I'm a contractor, I'm a freelancer, and if I can't work on my own and actually practice the methods that guarantee for me to have the least issues while I'm developing product, then I wouldn't be able to do this on my own. And the fact is that I get I get brought into companies to work on existing projects because they need somebody else who's not dealt with or somebody else who's experienced a similar technology to help them where they're stuck in. And if I wasn't good at it, then yeah, why would you be needing to hire me for this? And I'll be up front, there's been plenty of time, I mean, I'm going off topic here, but there's been plenty of times where I wish there was another person working with me on this project to help me figure out and maybe even review the work that I've been doing. But in all honesty, it doesn't work. Now, that said, that's one of the reasons why I love open source, because I love releasing my projects, because I do have other pairs of eyes, if you get people interested, who are willing to go through and spot issues and help you out with it. And if you're a freelancer, a contractor developing hardware, I would seriously consider trying to make as many of the different things open source for, if anything, for that gain. I would, I mean, I would say that for the very least, I, I feel that that is a great way to improve things for you anyway. But it's not like you can afford to hire another person if you're one per, one man band. But 
hey, you know, everybody has different situations. So going back to that company, that didn't work for me. Purchase didn't work for me. And in all honesty, the, it got to a point where the manager, which more often than not, doesn't know anything about the work you're doing, doesn't know any engineering, and I'll be upfront. The assumptions that you make, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the assumptions that your project manager is gonna make, especially if they don't understand the subject you're working in. And you could argue that maybe the manager wasn't a good, wasn't a, was, maybe you need to hire a manager who's aware of engineering and he knows what you're talking about, but not every company is in that situation. And you know, I'm, I'm not gonna stir up the pot there. I'm, I'm gonna let people decide whether they believe the manager should have an engineering background of the stuff that he's managing or not, or he or she is managing or not, or maybe they don't. But I can tell you that in the situations that I've been in, more often than not, if a manager doesn't know about the electronics or the firm that I'm working on, then they're gonna struggle to manage the projects that, I'm, that I've got going because more often than not, it's those assumptions. I'll give you a situation. Um, so let's say you've been, tasked, you've been given the task to port uh, Artos to an existing product. So you've designed your product not to use a Artos, maybe, you, maybe you've been asked to, to use free Artos, whatever you've been given. You've been given the task and you get asked by the manager, how long is it going to take you to, do the, to, do, um, to port the project or to, how long is it going to take you to, to get this free Artos up and running? Maybe that's the better way to say it. You turn around and say, okay, I reckon I can get free autos working maybe in three days. Assuming that you can give that estimate, maybe you're wrong, maybe you overestimate, maybe you underestimate, but that's not the point. But what's making the manager believe, or what the manager might be making the assumption, uh, might, might have made the assumption that by you porting free autos means that the project is now free autos ready. No, porting free autos to your hardware is a separate thing than actually porting your project into a free Atos system. And that's two separate tasks. If, if I get asked, can you make free Atos, uh, can you port your project into a free Atos working on a hardware? You know, that's a different thing. But when I gave the quote three days, that was me taking free Atos, uh, which is, I mean, there are plenty of Atoses out there, but free Atos was the case in my situation. Porting it to the, uh, my controller we were using, which was one of the NXPs, which happens to be one of the few NXPs that weren't natively supported, or that wasn't already ported to free autos, but anyway, that's a different project together. And I did that, uh, and then I quoted three days, and I did it within three days, and then the, the, the manager went ahead and had his meeting with his bosses further on. And what, did, what happened there? The, yeah, basically promised that the project would be done within three days. Uh, no, I still needed another three days to port the actual project that, I, that was written without free autos, or without autos in mind, which was just basically Imagine you've got, um, I guess the best example is, I, I don't know if you know what free autos are uh, or what an autos is, but autos is basically a way for you to be able to have multiple threads running on the semi-controller. With the microcontroller, and I, I'm sorry that I'm, I'm kind of going off topic here, but I just might as well just get out of the way kind of thing. So with uh, an autos, so imagine an Arduino. An Arduino, when you come to write code to it, um, assuming you're not using an interrupt, you say you wrote code to blink an LED, and that's fine, that's great, but that's considered considered to be done, uh, executed linearly. So they, they're basically, whatever code you write is gonna be executed once, and that, in my mind, I would say that's a single thread. Now, if you, are, if you decide to start implementing various things on the Arduino, for example, you've got a screen with some buttons, and maybe you are controlling not an LED, but you're controlling some solenoids, and you might actually be better off possibly um, porting that over to an Arto system. You might be not necessarily with an Arduino, that's quite a, under, uh, quite a small device for that, but you might be better off, um, and in fact, you will be better off running a, an Arto system, multiple threads, uh, because if you think about it this way, it, your, the, the code you've written to, to drive the LCD screen it's gonna be in the same space, if you don't use an Atos, in the same space as the code that's driving the solenoids, which is also in the same space, for example, that are actually reading your, your buttons. And so you will have situations where if the code executing the solenoids take longer than the time you need to register the user pressing the button and actually displaying that on the screen, then the user might see that as a, as, as a delay or as a lag in the system, and it might not give a good user experience. And I hate using the word user experience because of other issues with, that just remind me of client works that always ends up with arguments. But anyway, so with the user experience, 
And so by using a free Atos, uh, allowing you to basically have multiple threads of essentially multiple programs uh, running side by side, you can have one thread or one program handling the screen driver, another one handling the use of buttons, and another one handling your, um, your Solana driving. And then the Atos takes care between switching between those threads. Basically, it, if it's been done correctly, there'll be an interrupt in there. So if you've ever used interrupts on my controllers, there'll be an interrupt in there, actually cutting or stopping, or not stopping, pulsing the code, one of the threads or whichever one is executing to allow the next one to be executed. And you can set priorities of which one gets executed more often than the others. And if you've done it right, your user interface side of things will get the higher priority. So when the user presses buttons, the screen actually registers that, you actually see that responding a, re a relatively good um, uh, response time. And then the thing that the user may not necessarily uh, uh, detect or may not recognize that it's actually being slowed down slightly can be put down in a, high, in a lower priority, such as the maybe the driving the solenoids. Now there's loads of different situations you can be used in this. Um, for example, data loggers, if you've got a, um, uh, I mean, I, I give you a, a good one. So if you've got a data logger that's taking samples in real time, you might want to display that on screen. I mean, I keep going back to screens because that's where always, there's usually a good time for you to see that. But there's also real times or precisely, you know, precise real times RTOSs that you can use that are guarantees for a particular code to be executed at exact time every time. And I'm not going to get into that, but man, God, I've gone into a long topic on that. But the point is, porting that code, that RTOS code into a microcontroller, it's not the same thing as it's a different separate task than it's a separate task to porting an existing project that isn't used in an RTOS into using an RTOS. And so when I quoted originally, I quoted that. And so the assumption the manager made isn't the same assumption that I made and obviously went off and made that made, made you know told managers and or told their bosses and their clients that yes we can deliver within three days this new better improved system and no it didn't work because I did my three days, I achieved that I just managed to achieve that, but then you know that ends up being an issue with me. But again this is I just went from uh, off topic to another off topic. So let's rewind a bit back to the point that I was trying to make and that is uh, keeping track of times. So you just started out working for a company. What is the better way? So I I didn't enjoy project uh, project manager. Sorry, I didn't enjoy Gantt charts. That it didn't work for me. And there are different things you can do. You can some people tend to track all their projects by using a bit of paper, writing the time they started it and ended it. And you know that might work. And that to me, I find it that if you were to actually write it down and actually keep track of your time sheets, that might be quicker than the other method that I'm going to talk about. But there are some things that I would say that may not necessarily be a good thing. For example, if you're writing it down on paper, it's hard for you to go through and analyze how long things take and you have to physically go through all of them. So you obviously want to make this all digital and there are solutions out there for that and I will cover them in a minute anyway. Now, so let's kind of take a step back. What was I talking about? Um, company, I was. I mentioned that uh, assumptions that other, that, you know, manager makes that isn't necessarily the same thing. Keeping track, the importance of keeping track. Oh yeah, I mentioned that um, keeping track of time is important, especially for freelancing. So what I was going to say, uh, do apologize. I kind of went one too many different off topic there. Okay. Yeah. So keeping track of time. So if you're new to this whole thing, then it's important for you to try and figure out a system. And one of the systems that the, this company was introducing, the one I was start, trying to talk about, they got tired of me and the other guys that are working on. Uh, constantly missing our deadlines and just making a mark rate. And oh yeah, that's it. Because the manager didn't really know anything about the the background that we're working on, they relied on us, they, it was relying on us to make that, um, to give them a, a good accurate time. So basically this manager turned turn around and said, you know what, you're all gonna start doing timesheets and you're gonna give me those timesheets and that's gonna allow me to um, to track the time. And, I, and that's fine, I can tell you now that uh, I, you know, the arguments that I might have had, also the, the, the debates you might have with your colleagues about the pros and cons of doing that. And, and there's some really good ones and I'll, and I'll, cover, now, I'll cover that now. If you're keeping track of your timesheets, that is going to take away some of the time that you're going to use to actually develop the project. And that isn't necessarily um, a good thing in some cases because one, what if timesheets isn't the thing that you need? Well, maybe timesheets aren't, isn't the way for you to be able to get a good estimate of your time. Maybe it disrupts your flow so much that it actually hinders your work. And maybe you're not enjoying it enough. Maybe just like me, you don't like it, just like I did with the project, uh, project the, the contracts that I would do. Maybe you didn't enjoy that. 
And there was plenty of arguments. I mean, that's that's what, that was in fact one of the arguments that my colleague was mentioning that okay, uh, it's not good, you know, just because this project took uh, a day and I wrote it down doesn't mean that that same task is going to take a day the next day. And I agree, it isn't going to help you to give you an exact time if you're doing something that's similar. But what it will do, and this is the key thing here, it's going to allow you to build up a mental picture of how long things actually take. Because I can tell you now, I've been in situations where I've told people, it's actually gonna take me five minutes. Oh, it's just five minutes. Oh, just another five minutes. But in reality, that five minute job took 10, 20, 15, or however long. And when you start actually recording your times of the projects you've been working on, and you actually sit down sometimes and look back, you finally realize that you, you, get, you tend to have like an epiphany going, oh, actually, that five minute job took me an hour or all those little five minute jobs that I've been doing are actually mounted up to this long. So in reality, I shouldn't be saying five minutes, I should be saying this much. And this is what I'm trying to get at. Provide yourself a means to build up the mental note. Now, some people, and I'll tell you, this is not me, but some people can do this mentally. Some people can, by just having a clock in front of them that they can keep looking up to see how long something's taking them, they're very good at being able to mental, you know, keep keep that mental time space, uh, sorry, that time that they've spent in their minds of how long something's taken to do. And in all honesty, and I tell you, that's, that was actually one of the things that I was advised that when I went to one of these time courses uh, way back when, which to be honest, didn't really help me. But one of the advices that they gave, they gave me was to put a clock in front of you. Don't use your computer clock, because if you're using say like Windows, time or Linux time or whatever little clock that you get on your computer, don't use that because it's usually quite small and it's, and it's, it's always there and you tend to ignore it. Just get something that just stands out that's different and that you have to physically go and look at to see it. And I tried that. I, I went off to Maplin's and I bought a little cheap Chinese you know, thick little clock that I put just in the monitor and I, I need, it worked for a little while but I can tell you now that it had the same issue as the computer clock eventually you start ignoring it. Eventually you're no longer looking down at it because you're just used to it being there. The novelty to, for it to start, to, to start out with helped, but eventually didn't. Um, but I can tell you that you need something else to, for that clock. You need to be more, in, in, you need to be a bit more um, proactive with that clock to be able to actually make it use or useful for you. But that didn't work for me. It, in fact, that was kind of like the least favorite method because that just kind of took up space where I normally just put circuit boards underneath my monitor, which I think was a nice thing to have usually when you're working on electronics stuff. Nice boards you've worked on before right underneath there. I would, I mean, I've got a couple now that I'm seeing here, but anyway, that's off topic. Um, but that might work for you, but I can tell you that it didn't work for me. Um, but that's, going back, there's some people that I've met. I mean, even one of the guys that I worked with, he was good at it. He was good at just keeping a mental record of that the time that he's worked on and he will be able to tell me oh yeah that project won't took me that long and when we started doing timesheet because we were forced to do it and the company at one point um and i'd say force i mean i i took it on i in fact in fact that was actually the one of the things that actually worked for me was keeping timesheets but when we finally started doing that it was kind of cool looking back at that guy's timesheet so oh, actually he did estimate that long he that actually pretty much is what he estimated that's pretty good and that works for some people but doesn't guarantee to work for everybody. Uh, what does work is when you make a physical effort to do something. And if you're physically going to whatever system you're using to keep track of the project you're working on, that works. And I don't mean the software you can download that records all your different activities on your computer, because in all honesty, that, re that can remove some of that proactive that I was just talking about, that removes some of that uh, interaction that you need to actually do your job or to actually you know make it make an impact on what you're doing there's always something nice about working on a project that you've thought to yourself it's going to take me this long and looking at looking at that time and going oh actually it's taking me twice as long there's always that shock factor that make you remember next time and I've I've been doing it for so long now that I do feel comfortable telling people yes it's actually going to take me to do this now, let me give you a disclaimer though. Be just because I'm keeping track of my projects and I am actually writing down or keeping track of what project I'm working on, what task I'm doing, down to the, the seconds that I've been doing, been doing them, uh, it doesn't mean 
that I'm going to always rely on that to quote people on projects. But more often than none, when I've been given a task to do, I'll actually do some research beforehand to see how long it's actually going to take me. And in some cases, if the project takes, like if the task I've been given takes 10 minutes to do, I'll just do it. Because I know from experience, it's going to take me 10 minutes. I'm not going to waste time trying to estimate the time for that project. I'm just going to do it and just tell the client, okay, it's going to take me this long. And if they're happy, if they're happy for me to do it, then fine, I'll charge them for that 10 minutes. If they're not, fine, I've lost it. I keep it to myself. And I'm happy to admit that because in all honesty, there are just some tasks that that isn't worth you spending the time to research how long it's going to take you. Or in fact, even worth risking telling somebody it's going to take me 10 minutes, 10 minutes or it's going to take me five minutes to do it, but in reality, it took you 20 minutes. And I'll, I'll give you an example. If you ever done some web development or if you've done any databasing, the putting data to a database or in, putting entry or adding data to the database can take you quite a long time depending on how much data you've got. And in some situation, it might be quicker for you to write a script to reconfigure the data and send it through. In another situation, writing the script will take quite a long time to do because the data is quite complex and you need to actually spend time figuring out the pattern. So sometimes it actually pays to open up that file and look at the data and say, oh, actually that vehicle data time here kind of almost correlates to this data here. So I can't just write a script to convert this over to here and just send it off. In other case, you're opening going, what is this garbage I just received? Okay, I reckon it's gonna take me a day. And there is over 100,000 data points, great. And not all of them have the same pattern, great. We need to spend time to actually do something about that. Now, that is the sort of stuff you need to think about. Incidentally, that was all to do with, I, you know, Internet of thing related projects, uh, internet of shit, I guess some people call it. May have to blip that swear word because I do want to keep this podcast. Um, yeah. So, time tracking. So, what do I actually do? Um, because it's 37 minutes and I haven't actually told you what I do. So, I actually use um, websites and you can actually download apps for this website that I'm using. And there's loads, there's like a dime a dozen online if you're actually interested, but there are time trackers. Some are more complicated than others. Some are actually better suited for freelancing. Others are just basically that. Uh, the one that I use uh, is, uh, I, I'm not gonna try and pronounce it because I always tend to kind of screw it up. I think it's uh, TOG or TOGGL, or it's T-O-G-G-L. Uh, I will put a link to it on the show notes. Um, it's a brilliant site. Um, it's free, they have a free subscription um, with no free trials. I mean, I'm, I'd be upfront, I'm not getting paid for this. I'm just saying, uh, at least if you wanna try something out, um, there are various ways to do it. And I'll tell you in a second the way I was originally doing it before I converted over to the system. Um, it's free, it literally, you can just log in, have a web page running on site, and you can set up tasks. So you can set up projects, clients, uh, tags, and you can just hit start or even, or even manually add the data onto it. But what I like about it, and it's the reason what I was telling you about, sometimes you wanna go back and actually look at it, is like once in a while, I like to go back and create a report, which they like to do, and basically say between this time period, tell me, uh, give me all the tasks between that. And what you'll do, you'll group all the tasks based on projects or tags for that matter. And it allow you to actually, um, yeah, it'll allow you to actually kind of come up with like a, a, a pie chart or, or, or a line graph showing you how much time you spend between each task. And more importantly, you can actually click on those tasks to figure out, you know, break, well, those projects and break down down to the smaller tasks to see how long they've been taking. And that's great because basically as a freelancer, I like to kind of look at that sort of data and go through and see, all right, so this client, I've actually spent more time doing this. This particular task took me longer than I expected, but still met deadline, fine. You know, it's, it's important. Now, the way I was doing it before, which to be honest, if I didn't have sites like this to do it, I will be going back to doing it, uh, is quite literally an Excel sheet and just keeping track of your times. And I had, I, at the time, I had like a different um, Excel sheet per client and I had a template set up where you can just type in the time and with Excel or, well, uh, the, I forget what the, um, the open versions are, the open office ones are, but you can format the Excels to give you an exact time. And if you're quoting hourly rate, they're great because you can go in, type in a number and you can multiply against the time and give you an exact 
est or an exact value based on the time you spend. With this other side though, unfortunately, you have to pay to get to actually do things like um, uh, create billable, uh, bi billable um, tasks or billable reports and stuff like that. And, and it wasn't, it's not, yeah, that for what I wanted to do was just to keep track of times and that was enough for me. Now, regardless before that, I was just using paper and, that's, and that was more than enough for what I needed it. Uh, it was harder for me to keep tr to create graphs out of it, but it was um, using uh, paper was enough for me to mentally, well, mentally be shocked. I guess is the the right way. Be be shocked about how much time I actually spent um, keeping track, or how much I spent on a particular project. And eventually, when you keep doing that, you start building up that mental picture of how long something would take you. And that's the important thing. Now, I'm not saying to whenever you're going to create a new project to go back. Uh, whenever you're going to quote somebody for a project, I'm not asking you to go back through all your different timesheets and figure out what something was was clearly related and that give you a good estimate. The whole point of the timesheet is to try and get you to build that mental picture of how long something took you to do something. I know I've met people who do timesheets in little post-its notes, and that's more than enough for them to keep doing that. And the fact that you're having to write down how long something's taken, you're physically making that mental note of how long something took you to do. Now, what I would say is that that's great for the longer term project or the ones that take you know a couple of hours. But when you're working on small tasks, like for example, you've been asked, can you quickly send this email or can you quickly forward me this Gerber file? And you're quoting people, oh yeah, it's only gonna take me a couple of minutes. It is this software, so the Excel sheet, for example, or even write your own. I mean, anybody, anybody who's, 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 got, who's got Python, who can, who can write Python or any other scripts can potentially automate this a lot better for themselves. Uh, you'll be able to actually you'll be able to actually log those smaller tasks and be able to actually group them together. Where if you've got a, 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 a notepad on the side where you're just writing small tasks, it's harder for you to see all those little five minutes. Where if you can actually use software to group them together, that to me is the key thing. And that to me was the shock factor when I started working freelancing, realizing how long it actually took me. This is when I first started out. How long it actually took me to go ahead and do certain things. And in all honesty, that's the thing I want to kind of point out that if you're going to do contract freelancing work, bear that in mind that it is the small task that you aren't aware, the things that you probably don't think about, they may actually end up costing you money. For example, if you have a client constantly coming back to you and asking, oh, can you send me this? Or can you do that? And there are people out there, and this is this, this I pointed out, it doesn't matter if it's contract work or not. There are people out there who will not go back to their emails and search for the answer that, they, that you've already sent them a thousand times. And for a thousand, for the thousand and one time, you're having to send the same information. That might take a couple of minutes, but think about it. That's a, that's like a thousand and one minute now that you've spent doing that at, at the very least, and that is time that you can you can actually charge for. So do bear that in mind, or at the very least, those are times you need to take into account when you're working out the hourly hourly rates when you charge people. So with regards to time tracking, do it. It's a fine assistant, whether it's a software one or a phone one or a keeping notes of it, or even just putting that clock underneath so you can have a look at it, or at least writing down the larger times they take you to do something, just keeping record of that can make a big difference for, for you. So that is enough about time tracking. I think I've covered all, the, all that I wanted to cover on that. Uh, I do feel that I can go on for hours on end. If you do feel that you want me to go more about it, or if there's something that I haven't quite um, made a note of, do let me know. I'm happy to kind of go back to it. I am hoping that on the next episode, I'll go off business and project related stuff back onto um, or onto uh, actual projects that I'm working on, such as the robot. But I wanted to kind of do some videos first before talking about it now. But if you are, just before I sort of finish off, if you are interested in the project that I'm working on, uh, you can now find me on uh, or in Hackaday.io. I will be, I've created an, an account there um, so I can start posting the projects that I'm working on. So if you're in there, you can potentially start following me so you can start seeing that there. Um, if you are a YouTube, or if you're in YouTube and you want to, um, or if you happen to be around on that, feel free to follow me on, on YouTube. I will be, or at least add me onto that. I will be releasing projects on the um, image processing robot that I want to do. I do have plans to try and start, the uh, well, I do have plan to actually start doing a uh, neural network on that as well. Uh, but on the upcoming videos, I'm basically going to be focusing on explaining what I've done on that robot, uh, which is basically explaining the how he moves around using the micro robot, uh, the micro motors, micro motors. I mean, 
and I will be talking about what I think the board is going to look like and actually start videos, start doing videos on designing the PCB on KiCad or in, in KiCad. Now, the only thing I am not 100% sure what I'm going to do, uh, I'm, feel free if you want to leave me feedback on this or not. I'm not sure whether I'm going to go into detail on how to use KiCad while I'm doing the project whether or where I'm just going to basically instead just highlight the key bits that I'm doing where I'm doing the board. Uh, to be honest, I'm probably going to go for the latter because to be honest, um, there's plenty of good videos out there showing how to use KiCad and I'm not sure if anybody's going to gain from me doing that other than what's already out there anyway, both for the paid ones and not paid ones. So uh, I'm not sure if, I can, if I'm can if i actually going to add to that or not anyway. But the upcoming video is going to be talking about that. I am hoping that this robot um, will eventually get to a point where it's actually both doing um, object tracking, face tracking. Um, it's quite similar. It's going to be quite similar to the uh, what the the Open uh, is it Open MV already does in Hackaday.io. I, I forget. It's going to be quite similar. The difference is that it's going to be uh, particularly designed for the robot and with the with in mind of actually experimenting with other algorithms, not just tracking objects and stuff like that. I actually want to play about with actually getting it to learn objects, uh, which is an interesting one that I've been trying to get around doing for a while now. And I'm kind of hoping to play around with neural networks as well along along the same time. Because uh, it, to be honest, even if you've never done neural networks before, or if you at least partially heard it, you'd be surprised how easy it is to implement a very basic one that will get you some quick results so you can actually see what it's all about. Because the thing is, a lot of people think about, I mean, if you already know about neural networks, then ignore what I'm saying, but if you never dealt with it before, it's kind of easy for you to assume, or it's easy for people who've never kind of dealt with it before to assume that it's quite a difficult thing, but to actually do some basic stuff to prove the concept, it's quite easy. To actually do something that's useful, on the other hand, uh, I think it's going to take a lot more than the micros that I can get my hands on, or at least the cheap ones that I want to play with, but at the very least, I can start experimenting with some other stuff anyway, so it should be fine. So with that in mind, uh, I'm on YouTube. Uh, you can find me on the links below for that. Uh, feel free to subscribe to that. Uh, I'm on Twitter, both myself and the company. So Optical Worm for myself and Hash to Find a Lek uh, for the company. Uh, and then Hackaday.io, you can find me in there as well. Uh, where else? I've, there's loads of different places. But yeah, feel free to subscribe. That should that would definitely help me or at least encourage me into um, making more podcasts and videos on this sort of stuff. If you did find this today's topic quite uh, useful, or if you have a voice of what you think might be better, or in fact you have an idea of what might be better for other people, feel free to come and comment on both on the site or on YouTube. It might actually be, it might actually make it to another future topic if enough people feel that maybe I can expand from this because there's different stuff that you can do. Like I mentioned, you, uh, like I mentioned, like you um, estimating the time for your manager, you have to really think about what they might be thinking and whether they're actually aware of what you're talking about or not can make a big difference. Um, there was a whole lot of different pro a, a, a whole lot of different issues with the way the project was run then, but not just about time tracking. But yeah, definitely. If you find this inf useful, do let me know. At least give me the uh, thumbs up if you're on YouTube. So that is it for me. Uh, see you later. Bye. Bye.